I encourage you to join in worship with us. I just want to share um, a scripture and um, a few words from a devotion that I had this week. And it's from Ephesians 3, and it says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be the glory in the church of Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. I love that. We serve an unstoppable God who is able to do above and beyond anything that we could ask or imagine. And the commentary at the end of this devotion, I love the way this is worded. It says, all things become possible through Jesus. The very best that we can imagine of Jesus is just getting started. And I'm gonna say that again because I just, that just stopped me in my tracks. That all things become possible through Jesus. And the very best that we can imagine of Jesus is just getting started. Our human capacity to receive and to know the wonders of Jesus is just getting started. And that just blows my mind. And I'm so grateful that we serve a God who is that good. And it says, oh, all that he can do for us. Oh, that all he has already done for us. He removes the limits. Jesus is a savior worth having. And I love that commentary and that, um, and that devotion I read because it just speaks to the limitless God we serve who is able to do abundantly above anything we could ask or imagine. And he changes lives and he removes the shackles and he gives us the time and the place to worship him here and to receive what he has for us. So as we worship, would you stand and sing with us? And as we sing of this unstoppable God, I want you to think about that verse, that he is exceedingly able to do above anything that we could ask or imagine. And that whatever we think God is doing, that we think is, is, is good and complete, is just the beginning of what our God can do. Amen? Amen.
no mistake, when, when I consider the songs, when, I, when I'm thinking about what God, what you have for us this upcoming week, and I'm praying over the songs and thinking about just what is, what is God revealing to me, what should, what should we sing about, and I, I believe there's never a mistake. And for me,
that as we were talking about last week, that we would set our face and we would shout Jesus until we see a change, until we see a move, that we would be so steadfast with a burning fire that, that we would have that confidence to walk under that authority. And God, we just love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to dismiss the kids to Children's Church at this time. Um, I have some scripture I wanted to share. And again, um, I love how I love how God does things and how God ties things together. And um, specifically, I was reading Psalm one thirty nine two. And in this psalm, David writes, You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. David has a lot to say about God knowing us. God knowing us so deeply, so intimately. That he knows every hair on our head. That he knew our name before we were born. David also, in 1 Chronicles 28, verse 9, David is speaking to his son Solomon, and he says, As for you, my son Solomon, know the God of your father, and serve him with a loyal heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands all the intent of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. Consider now, for the Lord has chosen you to build a house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. And, uh, and again, I'm just thinking about how we were speaking from Jeremiah last week where it says, where, where God promises us that if you seek him, you will find him. If you seek him with a whole heart, with all of your heart. And that theme is, is reverberated in this first Chronicles. If you seek him, he will be found by you. And I love this ending part. Consider now, for the Lord has chosen you to build a house for the sanctuary. We are chosen. We are chosen to do something specific for the kingdom. We are chosen to build a house. We are building houses all over the place. Maybe not physical houses, but we are building houses. We are building units. We are building communities. We are bringing people together. We are sharing Jesus. And we are called with a purpose to do that. Whether we're building marriages, building children, Legacies can look like so much, right? Like, legacies can be something you did or said that, that stays with someone for the rest of their lives. You may not even know the legacies that you are building because it doesn't always come back to us. We don't always know how we've changed somebody's life. And so, as David talks a lot about how God understands us, he knows our rising up and our sitting down. He knows our intentions and our thoughts. And he knows, God knows that, that he has called us for a purpose. And that very last line of that verse says, be strong and do it. And if uh, that speaks to me, where it can be really easy to, uh, to say, God, this is just too hard. This is just too much. It's too hard. Uh, I am not cut out for this, right? We, 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 can be, we can be a Moses and we can come up with a whole bunch of excuses as to why it is not us. But God says, be strong and do it. Suck it up. Be strong and just do it. Do what God has called you to do. Do the hard things. And um, I hope that 
blesses you, but it, uh, that verse sure blessed me. And, um, and again, I just, these things come to me and, and then, and then I see how God has woven it together and, and, and brought it all together to make it so relevant and so personal. So as we sing this next song, I, again, I pray that you sing with an expectation of a God who understands you. He knows your intentions of your thoughts. He knows you're rising up and you're sitting down. We don't have to hide from this God. He is all-knowing. And he has a purpose and a plan for us.
Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working.
what you're doing. Thank you for your presence in this house of freedom, God. Thank you, Father, that you are came, your son came to free us. And oh God, we receive it. Bless the word that goes out, Father, that it will be filled with your words and not the words of man. And that it will, it will just hit our hearts right where we're sitting right now. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. So guys, thank you for being here today. My name is Mike Pape. I'm one of the pastors here. If uh, you're new here, thank you for being here. Welcome to the uh, I want to give a couple of announcements, guys, just real quickly. Uh, and then we'll make it back into the Word. And then this stuff's important, too. So uh, we have a homeless outreach coming up this Saturday. And the homeless outreach, I've been to one of these so far. Uh, it was really awesome. It's a great experience. And we saw people who were healed. Uh, we saw God healing people on the street from addiction. And it was truly amazing. Um, that's going to be this Saturday. I believe everybody's meeting with set at 7 a.m. Mike and Robin. And the event starts at 8. Is that correct? Okay. Mike and Robin over here. They kind of compose themselves, but they are over here. I mean, if you'd like to talk with them about the homeless outreach, please, um, please come see them. Hey, Mike. Yes. Can you show up after that? And put up okay. some hours. They won't ride with us. They ride with you. Yeah. I'll be honest, that's what I do too. <laughs> I didn't show up at seven. I, could, I was just trying to get out of the house. It was tough. Um, so, but anyway, I, it, it was great. I would highly recommend going and being a part of this as God is freeing people on the street. It's really awesome. John and Marla's house this week, 7 p.m. It's going to be the 30th, the evening of the 30th. Next week, I'm sorry, the 30th, 7 p.m. My dates are off, obviously. Um, we are really wanting, we have multiple homes that people are meeting in. This is important. We have other homes that are opening up. Jeff and Lil now are beginning to open their home. Um, there is so much work that can be done inside of a house, spiritually, uh, within community. It's really beautiful. We encourage everyone to get involved. This church is not looking to expand and make it next to the next mega church. There's nothing wrong with that. We're just not necessarily doing that. We feel like God has called us to plant churches. Just plant churches. Send people out, plant churches. Set up small homes, communities, get people in the community, in the places where they can uh, they can really spend time with the Lord, okay? And learn and, and discipleship, evangelism and discipleship. Reaching people, discipleship usually happens at homes really well. Uh, Easter Sunday, the ninth. Invite friends. <laughs> this is a great time to invite people um, to come in and to, to be part of what we're doing and to hear from the Lord. So I encourage you. There's a lot of folks, guys, that y'all know. They just, you know, they go to church on Easter and Christmas, right? <laughs> and that's that it's just kind of how it is. Um, this is a great time to invite people in and just let God do the work. That's all it is. We just let God do the work in our heart. Uh, work day today. We have got to clean up the kids' area. So if you're willing to stay and hang out and move some debris and throw some holes in the ground. I really would appreciate that. We have a pile of dirt that Steve Simmons dumped off this morning. So we got to fill some holes. Um, if you can, we don't get a ton of people, but we can see the hand from whoever's available. Just to fill some holes in and clean that up. We're actually going to put a fence and a whole new play set back there for the kids. So if you haven't noticed, like our kids' area is busted in the same because we got a lot of kids. We want to take care of them the best way we can. Um, which is going to include also keeping kids uh, inside. There's going to be older kids, sixth grade and up as well. Okay? All right, so we're going to begin. If you guys have your Bibles, um, we can start in 1 Kings 18. So you can start prepping your Bibles and getting there. But what I'd like to do, if possible, uh, we should have a slide up there right now. It says a recap from Daniel 9. So Creed, if you could put that up there. Last Sunday, we talked about Daniel 9. And we talked about Daniel as an individual. Setting his face towards God, digging in individually, <laughs> asking God to act, asking God to act on his behalf, asking God to send angels. We know Gabriel came, when Gabriel uh, wrestled with the prince of Persia, and Michael came to rescue him, the whole story of Daniel, right? So I know we, we covered a lot of things <laughs> uh, last Sunday that might have been a little confusing. I went through a lot of dates. So, which map? 1 Kings 18. I'm sorry, 1 Kings 18. I just want to do a recap really quickly on this, and then we're going to move right into 1 Kings 18 and talk about Elijah today. So if you guys notice up here, some of the dates hopefully are a little more clear. So I'll start quickly over here on the left. You guys remember last time we talked about 598 BC, okay? That's when the Jews went to captivity. Um, I know I threw a lot of dates. This just hopefully will clear things up. And I want you guys to see something. A lot of times we don't dig deep into some of the books of the Bible because it confuses us. 
And we're like, you know what? I just don't want to deal with that right now. There's a lot of numbers in there and it's just too confusing. So let's just stay away from it. But if you'll dig into it, you'll find a deep truth that God wants us to know. Because I, I, I'm going to be honest with you. There's something we got to start doing in the church in general. It's being able to go deeper than Jesus loves you. You know what I'm saying? I'm not trying to be rude. I've been there. Okay, I've been there. Yes, and Jesus does love them. You're right. That's a great starting point. We should absolutely start there. But when people have really tough questions, we got to have the answers to some of that. And if you have it, people, I'm telling you, uh, Paul was in the halls of Tyrannus. You guys remember that in the Bible? He was debating. Like the man would sit there and debate for hours with people because he knew he was able to apologetically explain his faith and he wasn't afraid of it. Because it does make sense. It's not a bunch of shit garbage, right? 598 BC, that's when the Jews go into captivity. Really important. 538 BC, Cyrus conquers Babylon. This goes back to Jeremiah. Remember the 70 years that were decreed? It was prior to 70 years, but Jeremiah says 70 years of captivity. Sometime around that 70 year period, the Jews were released. Um, Cyrus comes in, conquers Babylon, lets them go to uh, back to basically their home, back to Jerusalem. So that was Jeremiah. That happened. We talked about 457 to 458 BC. This is King Artaxerxes. Check this out. This is so cool. Because when you read Daniel 9, it talks about um, from the moment the decree is issued, he will prophesy 490 years. Have you guys ever read that or remember that? From the moment the decree goes out, 490 years. And people are like, what is, what's 490 mean? Jesus said he was 490. How many times did you forgive? Seven times 70. It wasn't just a random number. He was saying, this is me right here. I'm in Daniel's prophecy. I'm the Messiah. I'm coming once to book in, and I'm going to come back again. Second book in. Remember, book in is the literary device the Jews used when they wrote. Book in. It's everything in the middle is where we're at. Okay? So your first book in starts right there. 457, 458 BC, King Artaxerxes gives the decree. The decree in Nehemiah is to rebuild Jerusalem which includes the temple. That's the date of the decree. We go 483 years past that. Check out what happens. 26 AD, Jesus begins his ministry. Is that not cool? Yeah. yeah. I mean, that is an ancient book that should make no sense. That should not be a thing. Daniel did, I don't even think Daniel lived to see Cyrus. I'm not sure if he did it. I don't even know if he made it that long. But all of this happened. <laughs> so Jesus comes at 483, and then it talks about, the Lord talks about the people of the prince. We talked about that last Sunday. I know this was very confusing. That's why we go back over it. The people of the prince to come. The prince to come is the Antichrist. Who are the people of the prince to come? Antichrist. They are people who support the, um, the vision of the Antichrist. All right? Which, by the way, we talked about it. There's been a lot of them. Not just a couple. Adolf Hitler. Stalin. They're not the Antichrist, but they are the people of the prince. There was another guy named Titus. He was the people of the prince. He was one of the Antichrist types, right? In other words, serving Satan. That's really what it is. Against Jesus Christ. He came in 70 AD when Jerusalem was destroyed. That was all about the people of the prince coming and destroying Jerusalem, uh, tearing down the temple, which Jesus also prophesied. All right. The last seven years is your bookend. That's your last seven years of the 490. That we haven't seen yet. You guys with me? That is what we believe is going to be the time of the Antichrist. Okay, we have not seen that yet. We have seen Antichrist, 100%. Some look like Christians too, don't they? They sell a whole Christian thing, right? David Koresh, Waco. Have you ever listened to some of the things that man was saying? He could probably get up in front of a church and preach, and people would not know the difference. All right, he was against Jesus Christ, no question. Antichrist. All right, so last seven years of 490, that completes our 490. That's our book in. That's when Jesus returns. That's why Jesus said, Forgive seven times 70. Forgive until I return for the last seven, because I will judge all wrongs. You guys get that? We don't get to judge any wrongs. We can be upset or whatever. But we don't get to hold unforgiveness in our hearts. That's what he said. That's a tough one. Because our society teaches us to do what? To hold grudges. Don't you let that go and don't you forget it because they'll hurt you again, won't they? 
protect your heart. Don't trust them. That's what they teach. That's what I was taught. <laughs> Government employee for many years. That's what I was taught. Law enforcement for many years. Don't trust anyone. Hmm. Got to break through that. It's hard. It's real hard. Okay, guys, here we're going to go to today. We're going to talk about Elijah. We're talking about revival. That's our topic, all right? Daniel was an individual revival. He turned his face. He dug in, chased after God, and said, God, break me and answer to my prayers, okay? All of us are really kind of in that position, aren't we? Does everybody in this place have a prayer they'd like to see answered? Or are you like, man, I'm all prayed up, it's good. I'm good, walking around good, feeling real good. Well, I'm up here telling you I'm not good. Okay? What's that? I said, Satan, He never stops, right? And here, I want to tell you another lie from the pit of hell that I hope you're not believing today. That when something's from God, it's easy. Please never believe that. Please never believe that. It will usually come with difficulty. Your marriage, your relationships, your children, whatever it is. If your kids are doing wild stuff or whatever, giving you difficulty, <laughs> that is not from Satan. Even though you might want to say, devil, come out, Satan. It's not. Okay? It's not. It's part of the journey. God is using this refining. Look at the walk of the disciples. We've got to reset our mind on some of this stuff. And just understand, yeah, it's going to be tough. Don't quit. Okay. I want to take you guys to 1 Kings 18. I'd like to give you a little bit of history about Elijah. Am I familiar with Elijah? He's one of my favorite prophets. Yeah. yeah. I love him. You guys know? Okay. So cool. Interestingly enough, they don't even know that he was a Jew. You guys know that? They're not sure. History doesn't really necessarily tell us. But he was probably one of the most powerful prophets that had ever lived. He said he was taken up. It was like, and he didn't just like, you know, Enoch was just gone one day. Like, where's Enoch? I don't know where he's gone. It wasn't like that. It was like, he's in a fiery chariot. Going up to the sky, you know what I mean? Like, it was pretty dramatic the way he went. God took him up, is what it says. I don't know how that worked. I have no idea. That's what the Word of God says. All right. So 1 Kings 18, Elijah was part of a national revival. We, talk, we keep talking about revival right now because it's hitting our nation. It really is. It started in Asbury. It is still going. Uh, just watch Jesus Revolution. Anybody seen that yet? Go check it out. It is really cool. It's awesome. It's about the Jesus movement in the 60s and 70s. So many of these movements are evangelical movements that start with the youth. Have you guys ever noticed that? Yes. Many of them. They start with the youth, all right? Because when you're, this is so fun. I love watching this movie. When you're a hippie in the Haight Asbury district and you're on psychedelics and you're a drug addict, right? Just trying to, what do you think they were looking for? Why were they doing all that stuff? Just because they're rebels? Just bad people? No. no. What do you think they wanted? Peace. They wanted peace. They wanted to feel love. They wanted to be loved. Spiritual experience. Spiritual experience. Man, that was it, dude. Spiritual experience. They were trying to find who? God. God. And truth. That's what they were looking for. It was the middle of the Vietnam War. The economy was collapsing. Things were hard, things were difficult, they were trying to do anything they could to find God. <laughs> That's what was happening here in this time of Elijah. Guys, it's the same stuff over and over again. It just keeps replaying. Society to society. The Jews, same as us. It just keeps replaying. Alright, so here's the history. We had a guy named King Ahab and a lady named Queen Jezebel. Anybody named their daughter Jezebel? <laughs> no, not, not good. No Jezebel's in the room? Okay. What does Jezebel signify? What does it symbolize? What does it stand for today? What would you guys say? What's that? Yes, prostitution. 100%. Sure does. Party girl. Party girl? Yep, she was definitely a party girl. No question. What else? But even in that, it's. So I, I believe that there's a measure of deception in it. Yeah. Jezebel in the, the what is spiritually implied is not a party girl, it's not a harlot, it's manipulation and control yeah. and perversion. Deception. Okay. And it's deception. It's, it's okay. about control and uh, yep. bitterness and wanting what doesn't belong to you, just like Ahab. Like she went out. Yes. 
the manipulation and control is so prevalent with the Jezebel. But the world believes there's a harlot. Jezebel wasn't a harlot. She manipulated and controlled and took what didn't belong to her, and she killed in order to get it. She did, and now what's interesting about that too, um, I, I kind of see her connected to almost a witchcraft, yeah. a form of witchcraft, yeah. which is serious control. I do believe sex was a part of that. We'll talk about that. I'm not going to get into it too much, but yes, I do believe that stuff is all connected together with her. Um, she, I mean, but she has a horrible name. Can we all agree on that? Yeah. Horrible. Jezebel, they just call it the Jezebel spirit. I don't know, whatever. She has a horrible name. All right. So in 1 Kings 16, you don't have to turn there. I'm going to talk about that. Uh, 1630 specifically the word of God says that Ahab did more evil than any in the eyes of the Lord dude that is terrible like if that's what is said about you by God in the Bible I don't know what it looks like when you die but it's got to be hot uh, I don't I don't that's bad I mean all the kings of Israel were pretty bad there was only a couple good ones and this guy was one of the worst let me tell you how he really dropped the ball right off the bat all right so Ahab if you guys ever go back and remember, part of Jewish law and custom, God had warned the men, do not take foreign wives. You guys remember that? I actually heard that a long time ago when I was a kid, and I was afraid if I had married like a, a Latina or something. Like, what's going to happen? Oh my gosh. That's not at all what it meant. Okay, it's not a racist, woe. It's nothing like that, okay? Here's the reason God said that. God specifically said that not to separate. Here's what's happening. They were taking these foreign wives, and guess what the foreign wives brought with them? Foreign gods. Foreign gods, man. They got down with the balls and all the Ashereth and all these gods, okay? Uh, Nashtun and all these different ones. They would bring them in. So these guys, being really strong husbands, they're like, well, we're going to church today, honey. We're going to Ashereth Pole. <laughs> we're going to go worship Ashereth. Sure, baby. Let's go. Sounds great for me. And they would immediately forget the God of the fathers. That's why God said, don't marry, intermarry, because they're going to bring their gods. And what was happening, what happened in Israel at this time is they were setting up um, the Asherah pole. Have you guys ever heard of that? Okay. That was one of the, the, like, the temples they were setting up. They had all these, these temples and different things that they were going to and worshiping. And they were getting away from the God of heaven. They were getting away from Yahweh. Jezebel specifically was Phoenician. I'm not sure if that slides up there, but we should be on the next slide for you. Uh, she worshipped uh, Baal, that's how you pronounce it, and Asherah. Asherah, very interesting, going back to your point, Coral. <laughs> uh, Asherah was about manipulation and control. She was a fertility goddess. So at this time, there was major sexual issues inside Israel. I'm not trying to be the weird pastor that talks about sex in church, okay? Please, I'm not going to do that to you. But I am going to tell you, don't think for a second that the enemy does not use sex. He will mess with your sexual identity. He will use um, rape, molestation. He will do anything he can to pervert the nation's sexual identity. It's one of the first things he does. I have opinions about it. Maybe we can talk about it later. Sex is very powerful. It actually is a unifying force that brings people into one flesh. I think we're going to get to heaven and find out that it's a super, super powerful thing that happens. Okay? So the enemy perverts it and uses it. Does this sound familiar to them? Yeah. Are we you guys with me? It's twisted up. Okay. We are twisted up. We're in a very weird sexual thing going on right now in our nation. The Jews had the same issue. They had these four wives, four um, gods they were serving, okay? Much of it included a certain sexual identity that would occur. Uh, ceremonies, all this stuff was connected to sex, right? So that's what was going on. All right. Most of the nation of Israel including Ahab, because Ahab led. He was teaching the men how to lead. What do you think he was doing with his wife? Whatever you want, baby. You want me to kill somebody? Cool. Kill him. Because <laughs> I don't want to hear about this next week. <laughs> okay. Right? Ahab didn't care. He just had this beautiful wife. He was good. Whatever you need, I'll, I'll, I'll take care of it for you. Okay? He was not leading properly. The people were now falling into something called apathy and complacency. Apathy and complacency. All right. Because of this, Elijah prayed for no rain. So the story we're getting ready to walk into, there was no rain for three years. 
Ahab was fired up. Jezebel wanted him dead. Ahab wanted this guy dead. They wanted rain. He was, Ahab was sending out parties to actually search for water because they couldn't find it. And they would collect water and bring it back. The people that couldn't find Elijah were executed the moment they returned. That's what was happening. That's how mad they were at this guy. He prayed for no rain, and no rain fell. He prayed for no rain because they were all twisted up, worshiping foreign gods, idols, crazy sexual stuff. They were all messed up. They had turned away from God, became complacent and apathetic. The entire nation was in turmoil. All right? It was basically a spiritual civil war. The gods of Baal and the god of Yahweh. And the people were content to ride the middle. The people were content to ride the middle. A little bit of Baal and a little bit of Yahweh. Right? Isn't that easier? <laughs> All right, listen, guys. So, whoa, wait a minute. So what do we got here? Book of Revelation, the church of Laodicea. What does it say? Thank you. You cannot be lukewarm. If you are lukewarm, but God, Yahweh says what? I'll spit you out of my mouth. Guys, listen. I know I'm a provoker. I'm sorry. I am a provoker. Okay? That's what I do. That's what I believe God has called me to do. It's not to be mean, but to provoke. I want to provoke you today, and I want to give you an invitation today. The worst place to possibly be is lukewarm. God would rather you be totally dead and cold inside isn't this crazy? I don't, I'm going to talk to Jesus about this one day, face to face, and get a definition of why. It is so clear to me through the entire word of God. Either be for Baal, and I'll take care of you later, or be for me. But if you were in the middle, mm, I can't stand it. Ladies, first date with a guy way back in the day, get in the car, right? Where are we going? I don't know where we're going. I don't know. Where are we going? I don't know. <laughs> right, Carl's like done, done here. Right? When ladies say that, for your first date, are you done? You're done here, at that point, right? Because it's like I don't know. What is that signal to you? This man is what indecisive. Indecisive. We can't stay indecisive, right? And I, I got to challenge myself with it. I mean, because when you've been married, you know, twenty years, right? You're like, gosh, I don't know, baby, where are we going tonight? It's our anniversary. <laughs> like, don't be indecisive right now. You better have some place we're going, right? And that was so. That's what happened to Israel. They had indecisiveness and apathy. He says, "I really don't care. It's not special." This is what was happening to Israel. All right, guys, we're gonna move from there. All right, so um, as we get to First Kings eighteen, I want to say this. Uh, okay. We provoke you a little bit this morning. You can take me out and stone me later. Or whatever. <laughs> but in Luke 8, 43 to 48, you guys can write that down and read it later. You know the story. This is the woman with the issue of blood. Do you remember her? This is the woman who came from behind, snuck up on Jesus. You guys watch The Chosen? I love their portrayal. It's so good, man. She comes and sneaks up and grabs a hold of the him because she was... Desperate. She was not in the middle. She was desperate. Do you know all the social norms that she broke? She actually broke the law. She finished. She multiple. They, I mean, she was supposed to be cast out. She was not allowed into society because of the problems she was having. All right. She broke every law to get to the hymn of Jesus. I want you to think about something for a minute. Do you remember the disciples' reaction to that whole thing? Jesus said, "Who touched me?" Yeah. What do they say? <laughs> what do you mean you touched me? You're in the middle of a thousand hundred people, whatever it was, and they're all pressing in on you. Jesus, give me a break. What do you mean who touched me? He's like, no, 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 no. You don't get it. These people are pressing in. They're not desperate. That's us. Let me provoke you. Is that us? At times. We are pressing Try to get in, and then this lady crawls across the ground and grabs the hem, and we're like, oh, gosh, she's desperate. This is what was happening. God was asking for desperation. <laughs> Be desperate with me. Don't entertain everything. No, no, come for me. 
This is what brings revival. When you see revivals, when you see people's lives change, it's out of desperation that we reach for them. Not necessarily just pressing in. All right. 1 Kings 18, 20 to 21. So Ahab sent to all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, sorry, we're in verse 20, 21. Hopefully it's back there. Um, yes, thank you. All right. How long will you go limping? I love this. This is so good. How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. Why do you think they didn't answer him? Shame. Shame. Man, they were ashamed. Elijah's words cut to their heart. How long will you go limping between two opinions? Can we have both? The world and God? Sure, you can. You can have both. You can, but it causes you to limp. That's what this is saying. It causes limping. The more we step away from the world and the things of the world, okay? He's, he's, Elijah is giving an invitation. He's provoking, because he's a prophet, he's very provocative. He's provoking the people. How long do you need to keep doing this? You've been doing this for 40 years. You want to keep doing this? Are you having fun yet? Would you like to pick a side? Listen, Jesus Christ is full of grace. He is. But he asks us to pick a side. And guys, we are in a time now that we need to pick a side. Whatever it is you're looking for, he's asking you, would you please pick a side? Just pick one or the other. Please don't pick the middle anymore. One or the other. So verse 22, then Elijah said to the people, I, even I only, am left a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. He wasn't the only prophet, by the way. He just felt like it. You ever feel like you're the only Christian? You ever feel like you're the only real Christian sometimes? Right? It's not necessarily the case. It's just how we feel sometimes. Let two bowls be given to us, and let them choose one bowl for themselves and cut it into pieces and lay it on the wood, but put no fire to it. And I will prepare the other bowl and lay it on the wood and put no fire to it. And you call upon the name of your God, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people answered, it is well spoken. Like, awesome, fight on. This is going to be the fight of the century. I can't wait to check this one out, man. I mean, the people, you got to imagine all these people were coming to watch this, right? They were like, no way. This is going to be awesome. Ball versus Yahweh. Spiritual combat. Right? We're going to see this, man. This is going to be awesome. So here's what happens. We're going to jump to verse 30. Then Elijah said to all of the people, come near to me. Now, important to know before we start this, he says this after the prophets of Baal, what were they doing? You guys remember the story? They were cutting themselves, and I've got, I've got to give it to them, they were at least committed. They, they were at least committed, right? They were the cold, they were the, the, the evil side, but they were committed. They were cutting themselves and drawing blood, they were crying out to their God, and Elijah sits back and starts trash talking. This is the greatest story <laughs> in the Bible, I think, man. Elijah's like, oh, yeah, call upon your God. Maybe he's sleeping. Yeah. You know what? He's probably in the bathroom. That's what he tells me. He's probably in the restroom. He'll leave himself. Maybe he'll come back in a little bit. This guy is just... Elijah is literally provoking. He's provoking the prophets of Paul. And here's what happens. Elijah finally says, okay, are you done with that? Are you done trying to call fire down from heaven? your sacrifice. Okay, if you're done, now let me jump on this thing. Let me do this with my God. Elijah gives an invitation. Here's the invitation. He tells the people, come near to me. There's always an invitation from the Lord once we have fallen back. And it sounds like this. Come near to me. Would you come close to me? Jesus said it this way. Come follow me. Follow me. There's always an invitation. I want you guys to see this is actually, there's actually a bit of a prophetic word about Jesus in this, okay? Because if you guys look at this, um, these sacrifices generally were handled by priests. 
Usually it wasn't a bunch of people coming around, okay? So now there's an invitation to the people to come in to the presence of God. That's what he was inviting them into. He's saying, even though you have fallen, even though you have not been with God, okay? Even though you have stepped away from him, from the sin against him, really, come near. Come on, come back in. Come back in. He's still chasing you. And all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been thrown down. Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be your name, identity. This is who you are. That was an identity comment. You belong to the Lord God. If you're sitting here, most likely my guess is you need to hear this right now. You belong to the Lord God. You are set apart. You do not belong to your boss. You do not belong to your friends. You don't belong to whatever whoever's got an agenda for you. You belong to the Lord God. Come near to him. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two, se two seals of seed. And he put the wood in order and cut four pieces later on the wood, and he said, fill four jars, it was actually barrels, with water. And pour it on the burnt offering and the wood. Okay, and he said, do it a second time. They did it a second time. He said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. The third time, the number for completion, right? Three days. Jesus was in three days. He was resurrected. It was all connected. Number three is completion and a new covenant. Number three means new covenant. They were walking into a new covenant with God, okay? But what's interesting about this, he said, pour four barrels of water. Do you know what I said early on? They were in a drought. Where did he get the water? Where, where did he get the water? Yeah, it was probably miraculous, but they also believed this. That was water they had collected for the people to be fed and hydrated. Okay, here's what I need you to see about Elijah right now. I'll make this fast. He took, he not only did he make fun of all, he said, people, give me everything you have for your own personal life. That you will die without water. Give it all to me. He asked the people for everything. You don't have to raise your hand. You ever gamble? You ever that guy where you push all your chips into the center of the table because you had a couple or whatever? And you're like, yeah, here we go. I'm going to win big. That's what Elijah did. He literally put, they were going to kill him. You guys get that, right? If this didn't work, he was dead. He took all their water. And dumped it on top of a cut up bull and said, I'm gonna call fire from heaven. Buddy, he was all in. His chips were all in. Here's what happens. At the time of the offering of the oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, Oh Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, Lord, answer me. That this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their hearts back. Then the fire of the Lord fell, consumed the burnt offering, and the wood, the stones, the dust, licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, this is great, the Lord, he is God. Right? Yahweh's God. The Lord, he is God. And Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal, let none of them escape. And they seized them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook of Kishon and slaughtered them there. He killed all 450. <laughs> you know, does that make you feel a little uncomfortable? My gosh, this guy just killed all those prophets of Baal. Gosh, that doesn't seem right. That seems kind of mean. When God moves like this, okay, the Lord was saying, clean everything out. Clean your house. I don't want any of that anymore. This is a new start. Clean your house. Come near to me. Clean your house and put all your chips on the table. There's an invitation here today for all of us. Everyone here, I guarantee you, has a prayer that they want answered. answer. Everyone here wants something different. If it's not your marriage or you personally, it's the culture around us. We talked about last Sunday, okay? Why do I, why did, um, 
Daniel prayed for the sins of his people, not just himself, but the sins of people. It separated him from those sins. Lord, I don't agree. I don't agree with that. I don't agree with this. I don't agree with these political agendas, whatever it is. I don't agree with it. I don't, my people have sinned, <laughs> and I don't agree. This is what Elijah was saying. All chips in the center. So here's my invitation to you today as we close up. I want to give an invitation to us today just to ask the Lord for all my chips in. And if they're not all in, what do you want me to remove? Lord, what do you want me to get rid of? What do you want me to cut? Because I want to see a revival. I think you guys do too. We're watching it. I want to be a part of this movement of God. This was a national revival that was based upon people putting all their chips in and letting go of things that were not of God. You think you got anything in your life that maybe it's not of God? Maybe something's holding you back that He wants you to put all your chips in. Revivals start with people. People who maybe come into agreement with the Lord and say, God, I'm all my chips in and I'll be in it. So we're going to pray. Lord God, we want revival. We want it. We want to be part of what you're doing. But Father, would you speak to us? Are there things that you want us to let go of? That we can put all of our chips in the center of that table.
Yeah, I know it's, uh, if you haven't got your kids, let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to close this out. We're going to continue on. So if you guys want to stay and pray, you're welcome to. You don't have to stay. If you'd like to, you can. Um, thank you for being here with us. Lord God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for speaking to our hearts. God, we just don't give a 